So, I was intrigued by the title of this talk, Stained Glass Unbound. Um, when I heard that title, it made me think of that. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. You know, breaking free from things. And I have to confess that um, I'm quite happy not breaking free from stained glass. I, I adore it, as most people here probably do as well. Um, and as um, Steve said, he's known me since I was a little student caterpillar. Um, making my way, and I have to say, for most, uh, a lot of my work has been commissioned for egg timers. No, commissioned for um, buildings, churches. I, I love the aesthetic of a, a colourful window in a dark space. That is uh, my kind of catnip. Uh, and I work from home in my studio in West Wales, and I have to say, it's quite shocking. Can you all hear me, by the way? Yes. You're all okay? Okay, Andrew's thumbs up from the back. Yeah. Um, I have to say, on a, on a regular basis, I don't see anyone, because I live in a tiny village. Um, so it's quite wonderful to see you all. But this is me uh, a few years back working in my studio, and for the last 20 years, I've done commission work and taught at the Swansea School of Glass until a couple of years ago. And I predominantly more and more specialised in glass painting, both doing um, traditional skills um, and uh, sort of a, a historic copy with the students, which I have to say I absolutely loved. And I've got, there's a couple of students here who've done that project, so uh, <coughs> you talk to them afterwards to see if it was really good. Um, but really teaching glass painting as a skill for contemporary work. Because for me, I, you know, I love making stained glass, thinking of it as a living art form, and I'm sure many of you do as well. So learning techniques that then you can utilise for your own work, I find that really exciting. Uh, my very wise mother said to me earlier when I was talking about this, she said, uh, well, stained glass is always changing, isn't it? And I was like, well, yeah, that's basically the talk, isn't it? Stained glass is always changing. But... Um, I realised Andrew uh, certainly is going to talk more eloquently about the various things that can be done uh, in, with glass. And I've just, that was me pulling apart what I see as the, the elements of working with stained glass, light and an architectural context and art. And, and, and as they get pulled apart, you know, the, the greater variety of things that can be done. So when I thought about this talk, I apologise for this photo. That was me texting my friend when I was choosing glass for a project we were doing together. And that is, what's that face say? I like this glass. <laughs> I like this bit of glass here. Um, but what I realised was that um, glass can do all sorts of things. And for me, stained glass unbound is more about what I want to do with it. You know, or what you want to do with it, actually. Um, and those are the limits um, to what can be done. Now, when I started, this is some studenty work, and I, was, I felt like a bit of a dinosaur when I was at college, because it was, we went on a visit to a German studio, and it was all fusing and clear glass, which is wonderful, but it's not me. And um, I remember feeling like, oh, is there a place for me? Is there? Because I, I, I love colour. Um, and I'm, the other thing about Unbound is I'm going to show you some... I'm working on the concept of progress, not perfection. You know this, like, Instagram culture of... I never have a boring day. I'm always really productive in my studio. It's really going well all the time. Which is a complete lie, obviously. Um, so... There's a little bit of fusing there, and I think I fused some stuff on, onto some wire and thought, oh, I don't know about that. But I wanted to go through some projects where um, I think I'm bound for me is to use trying to find the core. Does it keep flickering? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Let me have a fiddle with the connection. I can see it out the corner of my eye. It's a bit distracting, isn't it? Um, was finding ways to work with glass in a way that I loved, and that was using hammer glass, 
using painting, using traditional techniques, but in a contemporary either context or style or theme. So not to think, oh, those techniques, they're old hat. Because there was a, you know, there's, there's always a bit of that, isn't there? Something new comes along and you think, if I'm not using the water jet, I'm not with it. Um, and I just don't really have any truck with that. They're exciting things, but they're all, I feel like they're all tools at the end of the day. And they're great to pick up and use, but they're just, they're tools. So um, I wanted to look at a few projects that made me think about how I wanted to work. This was a piece, um, I did design this, I did this when I was a student, but this was designed by Clive Hicks Jenkins, who's got a history of a theatre designer and is a prolific painter in Wales. But when I was a, a student, he came in with a design and he needed some, he wanted to work with a student to make it. And at that time, everyone else was fusing clear glass. <laughs> And I loved painting and, and, and acid etching. Um, so it was a really interesting project. And it was for a light box, which at the time was sort of new to me. And I remember thinking, oh, OK, what's that about? And it was really interesting. To, it was my first sort of taste of collaborative working, you know, and sort of that conversation. And realising it was a conversation, ideally. Um, the conversation might be, make that. <laughs> or it might be, how do you think we should make that? Or it might be, um, I don't really know, what do you think? You know, it could, it could be any of those. But it was a, it was a, it's a lovely little piece. It's about, it's only about three foot high, but for a light box. And it was really interesting to work with this glass and also with a person, which often gets a bad rap, who hadn't done glass before. But I found that actually quite exciting. I found that exciting and they were open, he was open to learning about glass and, and what it did and what it didn't do. So that was a very early sort of student work, as was this. This was a couple of years out of college. And actually, these were the people who'd commissioned this piece. It's called uh, Primavera. And it, I uh, wholescale nicked the technique of this from a piece that was in the staff room in Swansea. And it was, hmm, just being honest, it was not the design, but the technique, which was um, using tile spaces in a double glazed unit to hold pieces of glass sort of apart and doing some acid etching and then two layers of sandblasting so this idea of falling leaves and that was um, an interesting way and what it made me think about was how I wanted to get cast lights and colour and sort of a richness but if I was using a light palette by the way if you want to ask questions please do I sort of Sometimes, you know, you're sitting there and you forget it by three projects down. So if you do want to ask anything, please do. Um, but what was interesting, I also got to design the framework for the window because it was just a big opening. Now, it, it's sort of a bit of a ladder, but it was a really interesting way of working when I'd only really worked with lead, you know, to think about. I love the graphic kind of weight of lead. Um, and it was really interesting to see how that etching worked in that space. And can you see the lovely little... Oh, I need your pointer down. How tall is that window, Rachel? It's about three metres tall. Three, four metres, I can't, it's a long time ago. But it's quite a big window-ish. Sorry? I think it's like the ones in the room. Yes, yes. Gosh, I was gung-ho when I was first out of college. It's like, massive window, all right. Well, it was massive to me, do you know what I mean? Working like, we're going to make something. So scale as well. It did make me realise I like working at a large scale. I like. <coughs> it's kind of makes it forces you to be brave. Is what I found, and it sort of scared me, and I liked it at the same time. Um, this window was for a church in Barry. I must say as well. I'm sure there'll be things in here that you think, oh, I don't like that, and hopefully things you think more oh, like that, and I kind of love that. Because when I go and see glass, I want some. You know the film, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? That's my, that's my header for going to see anything. I think I want something I love, want something I hate, and there'll be some bland stuff in between. So, fair dues. Um, but for me, this window was significant because it was a window where I discovered um, I loved, although I loved acid etching and texture, this was a, a technical problem. So you can see the window here. It was really, really bright. I think it was a southeast facing window, slightly skew if. 
And when I was working on it, I ended up, my solution to the glare, because they had massive blinds, was to um, basically sandblast a lot of the window, not all of it, to sort of deaden it all, but really use a lot of sandblasting. So can you see these sort of finger marks here? So this is the beginning, this is, everything's got sandblasting to some degree or another before it gets painted. But I ended up with something that, thinking about compositionally, um, the whole piece. Again, this is about four, four and a half metres tall at the centre. But this is a detail from, from one of those areas. And working out that I loved pieces that you know, gave you something from a distance and then rewarded you. That whole thing of reward and care for the surface as you went closer. I also realised I love pink glass because I'm a classy bird with expensive tastes. Not my own. I know Rachel Mulligan likes coming past as well, um, but also sort of quite a quite a vibrant palette. I I grew up with a mother that wore fuchsia pink and jade and turquoise and orange and purple, often all at the same time. And I remember wearing black for a long time. <laughs> but it's funny how it slowly seeps through, isn't it? Things that you you maybe. She used to go to antique shops that I hated when I was young and now like drag me out. So it's really interesting how these influences come through, but I think they make me alive. Yeah. Um, slightly nerdy question, I'm sorry. Oh, go for it. Um, so with the sandblast, just going back to that bit, um, did you go regularly with samples that you've tested to see how they would react in the space or did you trust what you understood the glass would do, and then just went for it? I, this was 2008, I think, and by this point, I'd done, I'd done quite a lot of sandblasting, so I, I trusted sort of the marks I wanted to make. But I think what I did was I, I set it up, I, you know, I got my compass and, and looked at what position it would be in. So I set it up in a position that it would mimic that light, and then worked on it. Um, so, yes and no. I've never sandblasted, so you sandblast the clear and paint the flash? No, I sandblast all the glass, flash or clear or colour or pop colour or anything. But on the back of the, on the, on, on the flash you, you sandblasted the... Clear. Well, if you look at um, a piece, this piece here for example, this piece here, which is part of this background here, can you all see that pointer? Yeah. Um, is a piece, is orange on clear. So I would etch the orange back and I would use some um, glue, wood glue, um, and very loosely, and you can see there's a, this would be a clear bit of orange. Then I would put paint into the surface by that and then I put stain onto the back, which is what you can see on that piece there. And then I would put enamel on the front. Again, so it's sort of pink and purple enamels. So there's, a, there's this beautiful kind of complexity of surface building up. Um, and it, made, it, it was also significant because it made me think, oh, I, it was the first time I thought, oh, I'd quite like to make a little thing of that. You know, because you make a commission and then it goes, and I haven't got anything left of it to remember it by. So uh, I made some little pieces, um, and which are about, literally about that big because I wanted to remember kind of what I was doing in that window and what I liked about it. And also, <laughs> oh, yes, so that. Um, and then I, I was doing sort of traditional windows alongside this and then this, this project came along and this was um, quite an interesting project. An interior designer approached me. A boardroom was being built for a meatpacking factory. Oh, it's all glam, glamorous, isn't it? And, but they, they designed the boardroom with these windows. Can you see these sort of shapes here? These rectangles, these are wider rectangles. Those were the windows in the room, and then after they built it, they decided they didn't like them, so they wanted something to cover them. Um, so I looked at, I designed a couple of um, things for them, and this was basically 12 large sandblasted screens with bonded, etched elements based on the idea of seasons. And this was my very early artist's impression. I was the 
print stick, print stick girl. I was not on the old computer at that point. I thought it was still am. And, and it was my first experience of, um, I mean, these are 2.8, 3 metres tall. I couldn't, I couldn't make them in my studio. I couldn't make them in college. I couldn't. So it was the first time approaching, I think, Peter's studio in Germany. And because I, I love the hands-on, I love making, that was one thing I was realising, you know, but this was a really useful experiment to think, uh, I want to try working with the studio, was to send them, work out and send them these very simple, you know, there, there were these two, a layer of sandblasting on either side of these sheets onto which colour pieces were bonded. There's lots and lots of, there's no room to manoeuvre there, is there, really, for a fabricator or, a, you know, an interpreter, I don't think, sort of clear blast. So I, I kind of felt okay with that. <laughs> I felt in control. Um, and they did a cracking job. Well, in the meantime, I was, I was doing samples of just purely acid etch, layered acid etching. So with bitumen this time, grasses, um, honeysuckle, autumn leaves, and winter trees, um, doing uh, etching tests for pieces that I would bond onto it. So they, they sent those screens over. Uh, you can see the, the things more clearly now. On that one, the budget was li fairly limited. That's a song for the ages, isn't it? The budget was limited. Um, but I was really pleased that it brought some colour into that space. I quite like the glow of the sandblast. And it was a really interesting experience. So it's got, it's got stainless steel um, uh, coverings at the top and the bottom. And they're really... Yeah, that, was, that felt quite... Um, significant for me and I liked, the, I liked the combination of the bits I couldn't do outsourcing them and having that communication but it felt a bit like oh, I don't know walking the coals felt like oh I've done it I've done it I don't have to do that again okay that was interesting moving on because I sort of uh, didn't think that was me but then a um, little while later am I going too fast are you all right <laughs> Mm. Just my time. So this was a project for uh, a, it was an old police station, it's called Police Glass, um, and it, that means Blue Court, and it's quite near the, the Glass College, in fact it's in the courtyard behind it, and there was a competition for this piece, and I think it was a really tight turnaround. And I remember I defaulted. It was really interesting. I don't know about the rest of you. What, I don't know what you default to for designing, those of you that design when you're like, you've got to crank it out. For me, it's watercolours. You know, increasingly collage, but it's quite, you know, it's interesting, you know, what you, where your strengths are, because we've all got different strengths and weaknesses. So the idea was that the, the court, the, the building was being trans, transferred into student accommodation, artist studios and boardrooms. So it was this idea of this sort of organic sort of area of interrelating activities. Um, and the person who commissioned it, and it was uh, Gualia, which is the Welsh Housing Association, wanted this for the boardroom. And so you can see here the size of <coughs> what is this panel here, um, and it was going to be a double glazed unit, and again, not something that I could practically make, so in this case I worked with, again, I think the Peter Studio, because I started a relationship with them, and collaboration is a relationship, I think, and it was a really interesting process, and I sort of deliberately decided to try it, because I knew I liked making, but I thought, well, I don't know if I'm that person that can, will be happy to design and get stuff made, if I have the opportunity. Do you know what I mean? That, do I like that idea? Does that fit with me? I don't know. So it was really interesting because, again, control freak Phillips. It's not leaving a lot of room for a manoeuvre there. But um, it was a bit more interesting this time round because it was, it was a, a double glazed unit, but just literally the two sides of the unit. So there was enamelling on one side, facing the interior and sandblasting on the other side facing the interior. So I really like the idea that from the exterior, and can you see on that panel, 
that sandblasting is really much more kind of obvious. So that faced the exterior, so it's a very sort of graphic effect from the exterior, and much more painterly from the interior, and it was lit at night. So I sort of the seeding ideas of, of how you light a piece and how, it, how, it, how it's seen with artificial light. So I went through a process of the studio, I mean this is just a snippet, but sending me samples of what blue is blue, um, and uh, then a bigger sample and working up until eventually they made and delivered the piece. And yeah, it was really interesting when it went in. I feel differently about it now, but when it first went in, it felt like, um, almost like a surrogate child. Like it was mine, but it was, wasn't mine, if that makes any sense. Uh, it was really interesting sort of reflecting on that experience, and, but also the finished piece. Because, because it was hand painted, it wasn't screen printed, I wanted it had that watercolor feel. It was someone else's hand. So it was a really interesting thing to think about, oh, do I like that? I don't know if I like that. I like the window, do I? You, do you know what I mean? And so, um, so I think for me it reinforced for me that I definitely want my hand in. Not that I wouldn't work like that, but I definitely want to sort of play a part in the process directly. Um, but it was a, they did a great job, I have to say. They, you know, in terms of working with them. And then the third project kind of thinking about um, what I was trying thinking about was this was um, a school a church that had, its church had been condemned and they'd met in a school they met in a school hall for 10 15 years I think and the school was building a new hall and they were going to move in and it was a really joyous thing so this is sort of a building site and you can see they wanted a window and it was uh, there was a Again, a design competition, and the idea was resurrection garden. So it was the church, but it also had to operate as a, a hall. So it was sort of meaningful for the church, but not overtly um, figurative or anything like that. Um, and it was a big double glazed window. Uh, and you can see the scale of it there, and there's the door. And I realised that one of, one of the issues I felt um, was important to try and addressed for me was to use stained glass in contemporary buildings means engaging with all sorts of different kinds of people in terms of fixings and you know just the mechanics and the logistics of getting it in there you know leaded, not going oh, leaded window can't go in there at the end because I, that wasn't acceptable to me really um, not that it has to be leaded but do you know what I mean it was like okay so I just put this in because I thought you can see from the inside there that's I don't know, big expanses of flat float glass, a bit. Um, so I was like, oh, let's get a bit of um, glass in there if we can. So, in lots of ways, it, it was very traditional. You know, you can see these little panels there in sections, cartooned it. There's some, oh, all the kids did handprints, you know, all the lovely stuff. Um, and then it went in. But the reason I put it in, you can see I'm. That's a bit more clear to see. You know your question about sandblasting earlier. So that's, obviously I'm still in love with the orange. I'm still, um, this again is resists and then sandblasting to different layers of painting. But if you look at the window here, can you see this white gap here? It's not a border, it's actually an air gap. So what happened with this window was, um, a little bit of contact I've had with conservation was thinking about isothermal glazing and, and you know the idea of putting secondary glazing and, and an air gap to, to ventilate a, an original bit of glazing inside the window and I thought well surely surely that'll work for a new piece as well as an old piece so work with a team to just make these bars very sort of medieval almost isn't it but but drilling them into the concrete other side that's not medieval um, and then sitting individual panels. So there's an air gap all the way around and there's <coughs> little standoff column fixings here. So the whole thing sits inside the, the not inside the double glazed unit, but literally inside the space. Um, and it's, 
It also breaks up a little bit, which is quite nice. So can I just ask how long that took? Well. From design to completion. <clears throat> that I normally design and make and lead the whole thing. This one, I designed and I cut and painted it and then it was leaded in by another studio because of the time constraints. So I probably, I can't remember, is the honest answer. Because I, the thing is, all this time I was teaching part time. So if I think, or if I made it in one go, it probably took four months or something. But it probably took like <coughs> seven months because I was doing it a couple of days a week or something. I don't know if that's helpful. Sorry, yeah. So can I just ask, since that one is literally the double-bladed unit was in the window and that was basically in front of the double-bladed Yes, that's right. So, so but the one that you did earlier on, the, the watercolour, the one that was originally a watercolour, mm. mm. so the actual inside sheet of glass where you had enamel on one side and sandblasted on the other and vice versa formed one of the double-bladed pieces. Yeah, so all the artwork was inside the unit, literally on the, on the glass faces on the inside of the unit. Oh, so one sheet of glass was sandglass and the other sheet That's of glass right. was enamelled. Yeah. So it wasn't what two sides of the same piece of glass. No. Okay. No, and that I found really interesting. You know, the space as well was really, it was like, oh, that's an unexpected little bonus, you know, how to play with that. But yes, this is the, the double glazed unit are independent to the leaded glass here. Because I know quite often they go in there, but I really like the surface of it. What's the space between the two? It, it, uh, and no. no, it's about 50 mil. 50 mil. Yeah. So there's a, there's a nice amount of hot air going up there. How, how has it aged? If this is I don't 2013. know. It's a good question. Well, they came back to me about five years later. Uh, the vicar was moving on and they asked me to make a little panel. So five years later it was all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, don't ask her. <laughs> um, yeah. And those handprints, did you, did you actually put the children's hands into toxic paints or did you? I did. I tied them down. I said, I'm spraying, look away. No, I, uh, <laughs> I got that we did some workshops in the, and did, did it on paper, and then I used those as resists for the, for the actual um, enamel. Wouldn't that be good though? <laughs> right? Don't breathe, be all right. Um, are there any other questions on those ones so far? Just have a bit of a shoulder roll. Yeah, I'm going to say that was your solution to that particular problem, or was that a solution that somebody else had suggested to you that would work? It, uh, it was a team effort, it was a discussion about how could we possibly do this um, and it was in, in, the, in the vein of all artist theft, it was basically nicking the, the sense of the idea that you could space it off the back piece and as long as it was solid and secure. And the reason for that, for that being that they wanted a double glaze unit for um, thermal properties and soundproofing? Yes. So they wanted the stained glass window and they wanted... The so they get the best, so get both. best of both worlds, hopefully. Yes. Um, but yeah, that was the idea. And can I ask how you stack them up? Did you make them in sort of four panels high? So wherever you see a bar, yeah. it's a separate panel. <coughs> and what are they? With, are they with just the overlay lead where you put it on top of another lead? No, they're, they, they're, ste they're um, coated steel bars here, mm -hmm. uh, um, a T-section, oh. and then they're just sitting, that's what I mean about, you know, okay. it's quite not, you know, it's like a new version of an old system, really. So they're just, they're only supporting the weight of a, a single panel and they're strengthening um, steels in there as well, just to give it more rigidity. Stephen. I just get the impression that you got turned on by the whole look of you see medieval glass in store like that. It's not really about that. It's just that great idea of that standing proud, isn't it, in the gap? Yeah. It's wonderful, that, yeah. I love to, that's great bringing that to contemporary work. I like that. 
Well, I think there's a lot that can be offered, isn't there? And it's not, right, instead of thinking, oh, I've got to become some kind of engineer, it's like a lot of it's, it's still there. And also, I do like that appeal. And I think I like, I mean, I do, I do like big expanses of, of unbroken glass. But in this particular case, I, I felt that this mass, you know, it's got quite a traditional shape, hasn't it? But then you've got these long, great long sort of ribbons of flat glass in the, in the double glazed unit. And for me, one of the aspects of the job was that they were coming from this home that was sort of traditional, you know, the, the older than Victorian actually church. So there was an element of wanting to retain some of that kind of colour and richness. And so that was playing into the job as well, you know, so uh, scaling down the, the openings. But yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting thing to try. What about the insects trapped? behind the glass between your glass and the double glazed unit, or was there some way in which your glass was sort of sealed? No, it is open, and we talked to them about this. So this this gap around the edge is, I mean, yes, it's going to be a bit of a spider trap. <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest, it is. But I, they, they were removable beads that put them in there. And also, the gap around the edge is actually about, it's about four inches wide. Right. So there's an element of, you know, getting there with your feather duster job. Yeah, but that's how a lot of medieval glass gets smashed. Your gorgeous glass. I think you have to say, you have to tell the, the, the congregation you want a very, very fluffy, feathery dust. Yes. Dust. Basically, it was, leave it alone, you know, unless you get, leave it, unless you get, you know, something quite large getting trapped and dying behind there. But also, also at making it so that it, you know, we didn't silicon these in or something, you know, we, it was actually, if, if they need to come out for a clean, then that's doable. It's not, no, no. So they're, they're screwing beads, so, it's, so you can just... Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the fitting of the bars took longer than the fitting of the glass, because that's the bit that needed to be spot on yeah interesting thing to do though um i'm gonna have to go back rachel a good old um, gander how many of you go back to check oh very good question. derek <laughs> no well it's an interesting thing actually isn't it it is it is i've recently oh, i'm going to talk about projects in a minute where i'm doing a little thing for them few years on and it's really interesting one of the th things about the project was to get feedback from people and it's made me realize how little kind of feedback you get after a project's finished you know it's just like giving birth and you go here you are um does that more in conservation oh yeah i go back you've got to you've got to do you yeah. hmm. part of the fun yes. isn't it yeah, part of the fun. <laughs> it is an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> I always think if there's a problem, they'll give me a ring. But also, I spend a lot of time with a lot of people trying to make, tr making sure, you know, worst case scenario, and planning for it, I suppose. Hmm. Now, I'm going to move on to a, couple, a few projects now that um, I did either as part of a larger team or, or in collaboration with someone directly. So not just me going here make this, but a conversation about what should we make. I think um, a couple of you have seen this, and I know a few of you. I think you came to the opening, didn't you, Steve? Jackie's in it. So this is where I used to work in Swansea, the glass um, where the glass college was housed, and. It was a piece of work for this tower up here. You can see there's a four-sided square tower on top of what is the Alexander Road building in Swansea, which houses design craft um, and other courses. And this, this was the, the tower. And it was refurbished and reinforced because it was falling down. And the university decided to commission a piece to <coughs> celebrate the 
um, stained glass course in the college. And there were lots of discussions about how to do that. So it ended up being a staff student project. Um, and all the staff at the time were involved in sort of the designing and then students were involved in different aspects of making the piece, things like um, bonding. Um, because this was the design we came to. We went through lots of discussions about, shall we put it, they were double glazed units in these arches. And uh, double glazed units break down, as we know. And because of the position, um, there were lots of discussions and it, it was about how to celebrate what we love about stained glass. So it was, it was to make a contemporary work using the materials and the, the techniques that we thought were uh, worth celebrating. So handmade glass um, and using contemporary techniques. So we designed a series of what ended up being banners hanging within the tower space. So I think of it like a, I don't know, like a hall with celebratory banners but made of glass. Um, using sort of industrial shop fittings so that they're suspended from this top, from a top rail here and sighted on the base, but basically they're, they're not load bearing, they're, they're hanging from the top there. And using, uh, this is a different iteration, but you can see going around the tower and a continuous uh, band of water jet cut glass, the idea of sort of the the bloodline, the continuation of lots of different people going through the college and going through the spectrum of glass. And you can see it's quite high up, so this is the meeting room down here. Lovely white walls with a bit of light to be cast about as well. That was uh, um, the idea. So this is um, a couple of my colleagues from Swansea working on glass toys. And this is Lisa Burkle here look, thinking about um, some sandblasting techniques, but on the whole, the only techniques we used on there were sandblasting and some enamelling. We wanted to really celebrate the, the beauty of the glass itself. And um, I project managed this and I cut most of the glass and so I decided a lot of the palette, so obviously it's orange there. I've only just realised that, I picked a slide with the orange one. Um, but they're working with my colleagues to try and utilise their skills. So Lisa is a fantastic surface um, decorator, so she does a lot of very subtle uh, and strong sandblasting, acid etching, mecha enamelling, things like that. She's layering, <coughs> it's kind of, she's very, very strong in that. So I asked her to think about some of the, gosh, that is a bit annoying, isn't it? Um, sandblasting techniques. Marilyn, uh, another colleague, uh, it does beautiful calligraphy, so she did some text work on there. Um, this piece here is part of the water jet cut bloodline, and Kath Brown, another colleague, did sort of landscape studies and, and did some lots of lovely drawings to develop this, this idea of this undulating sort of line with movement in it. So all of these pieces were bonded onto large backing sheets. I love this photo. That's the student here. That's uh, Aaron, have a look. So part of it was to use these as exercises for students to try out. So this is two-part silicon bonding, um, which was used to bond most of the glass on, and then in-situ bonding of, I don't know, did anyone send that, put a symbol into this piece? Yes, yes. So we sent out a call for makers to send in makers' marks, which were made into small, like, almost like a little DNA chain at the base of the windows, and you can see. So these all represent different artists, um, and they were bonded in with um, VHB uh, tape, clear tape, in situ at the base of the windows when they'd gone in. Um, and this is one of them here, while the scaffolding was in up at the same there. So it's got this beautiful kind of ribbon of white glass and the, the, the pierced water jet piece continues through in, in sandblasting. So it's like the actual holes all the way through the glass? Or yeah, they're holes <coughs> to give a different surface. I mean, you can't see it on here, but you know, in situ you could, you know, the different, slightly different surface that will give you 
But what I liked about it was that to me it still said stained glass because of the, the glass that we used. Um, but it also said contemporary work, which I thought was entirely fitting for something being made in 2018. Um, and yeah, it's really quite beautiful how the light, I mean, that's, we all know, you know, experiencing, you, experiencing glass is the, is the right phrase, isn't it? So this is one snapshot of a moment in the day of the light going around. Um, but that was an interesting project of project managing a much larger team. And obviously the phrase herding cats comes to mind, but I was one of the cats as well. So a um, great bunch of people and utilising people's strengths was really quite a privilege actually. Um, you know, delegating and trying not to micromanage, that's, as we can see, I have control freak tendency. So uh, that was really quite a wonderful thing to see how beneficial that could be. Um, Another project that happened fairly recently um, was this piece for friends of mine up in Cumbria. Um, and it was quite a special piece because my friend liked my work, seen my work for a number of years and said, oh, just can you, can you do us a window? And um, they were building a, a new part of the house because um, my friend was quite ill and unfortunately died. Um, before the window was finished, but it was to <coughs> sorry, just a moment there um, to celebrate them, their family. You know, it was all about making the most. And they, I love like cruel embroidery, Jacobean embroidery, that sort of stylized uh, embroidery work. Steve mentioned I'm inspired by textiles, which I am, and I was. Uh, uh, having a moment of uh, looking at that, and they had very sort of strongly stylized work around the house. So, I, in this building, sorry, let me go back. <coughs> this was the new building, and again, these, this is a, a, an impression. These windows are in oak frames that are hung, again, to the interior of the glazed opening. So they're they're basically standalone pieces of glass that can be taken down. Partly, again, to, to get the benefit of the double glazing and the insulation and, the, and everything else, but to have stained glass in there. And um, also, <laughs> not interrupt this rather fantastic view, which is over the back of the Lake District. So it's sort of, and it's lit at night. So this was the idea, and the family are all, I mean, it's a piece of uh, rather exuberant whimsy, I have to say, but it was right up my street. And um, in the background here, I took the idea of um, the idea of touch, and I asked all the family, much like the, the school window, to draw around their hands um, and to make a texture in the background. Not lots, of, not lots of handprints, you know, not lots of very obvious handprints, but so there would be an element of when they looked at the window. Um, the person who's no longer there is there in that window physically, almost, you know, like their, their physical presence is there, and all the rest of the family. So we've got all the kids and grandkids represent, you know, they've all got their own flower, all of that. But it was more about exploring the way I like to work. So this is me um, in the studio at the time. And it was significant because I had started working um, a lot more with vinyl cut resists and plotters, and um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it enabled me to make a piece that was, you know, that question of like, if you left your own devices, what do you get up to? Um, and it's sort of a stepping stone into actually being brave enough to make pieces about, you know, things that are just what I'm interested in. So, and I think, and also being able to put, again, stained glass or the, the qualities I love about stained glass into a contemporary setting. 
um, this time in, a, in an oak frame. And then, finally, um, I the last sort of bit in the puzzle for me the last few years has been working with another artist called Linda Norris, who we live in the same village. We lived in the same village, Mein Clochog, say it with me, Mein Clochog, in Wales. Um, it actually means ringing stones, which is rather beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and oh, he wants to get involved and talk. Do apologise. And we lived and knew each other for five plus years, just as friends. Before she was uh, a painter, an abstract uh, sort of landscape abstract painter was her background for many years, um, and she became interested in glass was doing cast pieces, um, sort of layered, looking, looking for ways to extend her painting practice in glass, really. And collaboration on non-glass projects, because the first project we did together was for this building, which is the Royal Chapel, and this is the Royal Chapel windows here. And it came about, I say non-glass, because it really opened my eyes to, you know, to, thinking about putting glass in places or, or, or pushing the boundaries of where you want to put glass. This was a commission from CADU, which is the Welsh Heritage Agency or, or, or the equivalent, and they had put out a brief for interpretive works for, this is Colmy Castle, which is in North Wales, it's on the <coughs> North Wales coast, to tell the story of the castle. And had been an open call to all sorts of artists. It wasn't a glass commission, it was just, how to tell the story of the castle and they shortlisted a number of artists of which Linda was one based on her painting background. So far so good. So this is Linda here, um, you can put a photo of Jane, well done Linda. And she went up to, this is some, some of her work, a cast piece here which she's done in glass, that's a peregrine's foot and she went up to North Wales for a site visit and there was digital artists, woodworkers, metal work, you know, all sorts all sorts there to do a slight bit to see what's going on. And when she was there, she went to a little planted no museum and saw some fragments of glass that had come out of one of the churches up there, beautiful fragments, I think have now been restored uh, and put back in a church. But she was sort of went, hmm, I like them. And she knew I liked glass, stained glass, and she came home and showed me some photos. And I think the proper phrase is we geeked out together um, and said, oh, maybe we should think about putting some glass back in the castle. And in Comic Castle, the, the restoration that was going on, they had restored the chapel the most in the castle, so they reinstated the floor, the ceiling, so it had a really lovely feeling of completeness, much more than the rest of the castle. Has anyone been there? Has anyone been up to Comic Castle? Yeah. <coughs> oh, well done. Yeah, so, um, well done. Uh, sorry, well, uh, some Rachel. Um, I've never been there, um, but I have to say, there's a, I've learnt a lot about Welsh castles in the last five years. Um, they're amazing, some of them, but uh, it was really interesting collaborating with someone else design wise. Um, um, we've talked about it quite a lot, but we decided to put a proposal in for, to reinstate some glass into the Royal Chapel because why not? I thought they'll never go for this. But we did loads of research, we both love research, both love historic settings, both love working in old buildings, um, and we created, we looked at lots of old glass in North Wales, medieval glass, fragment windows, one of my favorite things, fragment windows, and made this sample panel for a proposal, which is bits of, bits of old uh, sort of, uh, older glass in North Wales, but also little drawings of rats and textures from all sorts of places. This is the heraldic shield of uh, the last Prince of Wales, not, not Charles, but Llewellyn, and uh, sent this off going, wouldn't this be fantastic to reinstate some, you know, your, your chapel is sort of getting reinstated, wouldn't it be fantastic to reinstate some colour and do uh, a fragment window that tells the story 
It, it was made to look like a, a fragment window, hopefully, using lovely handmade glass, but with distinctly contemporary references in there. So there's a mobile phone in there, there's a mountain biker, there's a tractor, alongside lots of other things, like we looked at lots of medieval manuscripts. Um, this was uh, the tower that underneath the, the Queen uh, established a garden, brought the hollyhock to Britain. You know, you like one of those little snippets, weird snippets you get when you design something. Um, but also, um, so medieval music that might have been sung in the chapel notation, but also textures and rubbings from uh, around and about the castle. Right, who can spot the mountain biker? Yeah. Hands up. Yes, just like this. <laughs> so, um, there he is. So, um, what was delightful to me was that these are secondary glazed and they are on very substantial manganese bronze bars, low frame on the sill, so there's loads of support here. But these windows were open to the elements for many, many years, you know, hundreds of years, and the stone has got this beautiful weathering. And can you see this, this grid behind here? Can you see those lines there? So there's some glazing already there behind it. So again, this was put in front, but this beautiful, beautiful shape that was scribed off the stonework and, uh, and decided to sort of infill, keep the lancet, the original lancet, just infill this beautiful blue. Oh, and I love that, that undulation, that shape. That was a really lovely surprise um, to work on that. Um, Rachel, can I just ask, how did you take the templates for that, or how did you... I took a carpenter, okay. <laughs> said, can you scribe that opening, please, with a piece of plywood. Um, so, to, to get that exactly. Yeah, so I, he did try and teach me scribing. I can sort of do it. But it was just, um, again, ending up with... And then it's got really substantial lead on the exterior uh, as well. Are they really close fitting to the stone? Or have they got a gap like we had before? Um, if you can see there, they're, they're sort of between... They're about 10 to 20 mil away from the stone, I would say. It varies a little bit, but they're fairly close fitting. Um, yeah. You said you had some rubbings. Did you actually take rubbings and then sort of make more from them, or did you actually somehow screw and put the rubbings on? No, we went. We went. Uh, we went out round the castle and took rubbings, and then we either we either um, did painting, sort of inspired by that, or did um, uh, what did we do? Oh, we know what we did. We did quite a lot of transferring some of those textures and um, etching them so they became sort of a, and then rubbing paint into those, so they became quite sort of quite tactile things as well. Um, some of the things we plotter, cut and some are hand painted, there's lots of references to, you know, to the castle in 1380 when Edward um, was visiting. And then a second uh, piece we did was then um, for Beaumaris Castle, which, um, was quite different. We worked together, and but it's it's the last castle ever built, and it's unfinished. It's got 18 toilets and no first floor, um, and it was uh, a very different proposition. Look at that beautiful space. That's just such a. That's just painted, so it's looking good. Um, but in this case, we, whereas the last one, I suppose you could mistake it for an older window, we felt like in this case, and this is part of sort of the unbound thing, I suppose, is although this is a chapel, it's disconnected from its need to be, you know, um, fulfilling a, a function in the worship. It's, it's disconnected from the need to be telling biblical stories now. And Cadder, again, who, who commissioned this, it was an interpretive work to tell the story of the makers of the castle. So we took inspiration from 
uh, the plan of the castle and looked to uh, it's, it's, it's a double ringed castle so it's got this amazing courtyard very symmetrical and we, we wanted each light to, to do its own work and bring colour into that space but if you that is very very light when we first went there it was not very very light it was uh, dark so it's an interesting project because to me I like glass painting there's no glass painting in this it's a little bit of enamel colour modulation but it's all um, sandblasting, fire polishing and sandblasting to use rich colours but not to darken down the interior anymore so it's a really interesting uh, sort of challenge to do that um, and this is Linda and I work on it in my studio all up and you can see there's some paper the manuscript is something called the pipe rolls which is where um, all the wages and the, the complaints about the toilets being blocked are on a medieval <laughs> pipe roll um, in the National Library, but also lots of patterns that we gathered from, uh, again, around uh, various places and put throughout the window. And also, spaces here, you'll see here, the only, there's barely any finds in uh, Bow Maris Castle apart from maker's marks which are carved into the castle walls. So it's really interesting to walk around, you know, little initials to for people to claim their, their wages. Um, so we work with the plotter, and this was quite interesting to work with someone and buy equipment together by, um, to do new techniques. That's the way I found really interesting to, to push work on. So things like uh, Rapid Mask, which is a, which is a, um, a, a photo etch resist for sandblasting to get lots of detail. If you want to talk more about it, talk to James because he's been, he's been bossing it. Uh, um, and also a vinyl plotter <coughs> to test out. Um, I love, lo really love hand resist, but uh, it was good to try that. So on these pieces, these details, there's little water jet cut maker's marks that are bonded onto these backing sheets. <coughs> so the hope being that there's all these relatable patterns and forms, but quite a contemporary um, style to them. So, and then this was... Um, the last big project I did before lockdown and, and Covid hit, so this was a church in Oxford and it was um, a scheme of glass. It started off as being for a window, a west window in the tower, and it was to celebrate bell ringing in the church, that, that was the, the commission. Um, and again it was a, a competition and I was very happy to be chosen to do it. And long story short, they definitely wanted an abstract window, whatever that means, and, uh, but to celebrate bell ringing and to bring light and colour into the church. That is uh, a photo of dusk. But as part of my proposal, um, what you can see there is um, they've got eight bells above. See that ceiling there? Above there is the ringing chamber. Yes, I did have a go. Yes, I was rubbish. Um, uh, the, but it was really interesting to go up there and see, you know, just the, the motion of the sallies, which is the ropes, the sort of the dynamism of the ringing, the size of the bells went right back up, right up into the ringing loft with the bells. That's quite an experience. Anyone sat next to a massive bell when it gets rung? Oh, it goes through your whole, it goes through your body. It was like a physical experience and I loved it. But to bring light colour, my suggestion was to put some reflective elements within the tower. That's all I said. That's all I said. And so I designed the window, and then Linda and I worked on these, which are mirrored banners that are sighted on the walls, um, that are actually using what's, what are called ringing methods, which are, is the music for bells. So if you're a bell ringer, you could look at those and go, um, I know how to play that. Um, again, kind of a banner aesthetic. I hadn't sort of realised that until I uh, looked at this together. But this was the design. This is a little architectural maquette where Linda and I tried out, you know, what happened from various points, how you would actually see it. And there were lots of things I loved about this window. Um, commissioning some bullions to be made, some um, roundels, which I adore for their light sort of throwing properties. 
but also things like uh, there's some medieval tiles in the church just playing with scaling up uh, some of those motifs, maps, um, and also just trying to create a dynamism of, of the piece. And it's in the west window opposite the altar, and it was just very plain blazing before. So the idea of, sort of the Alpha and Omega in the middle, you know, this, this function in worship, it's, it's a huge church. Um, and then just a little bit of the ringing methods here. So it was a combination of things for me from vinyl cut. Uh, we brought a plotter together because it let us play. And I, I would really say that um, one of the things I'm increasingly finding is that the first thing to go out the window and one of the most important things is play, trying things out. Trying things out even when they're a little bit rubbish for quite a long time. It's sort of counterintuitive with glass, but sort of playing on paper or playing with card or playing with paper, whatever it is, smiling over there, you do this, don't you? Uh, because I find the thing about keeping my creativity alive is that it doesn't survive in a vacuum. So, you know, looking at stuff and playing stuff. So, you can see the ringy methods here, this is on red flash, and just building up textures. The trusty old glue, who recognises that resist? It's the trusty bubble wrap, come on. <laughs> bubble, bubble. Printing with bubble wrap, etching back, oh, we love it, piggy mark. Anyway, but also, you know, really enjoying, really enjoying the, the effect of sort of these 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 much more sort of cleaner resist that I can get with glue and this this digitising of the, the methods onto sort of lovely glass, which are then working into with paint and enamel. Um, I'm just about to clean that up. I look at that slide and go, cement, I'm picking that, don't worry, I'm picking it. Um, so it ended up this kind of effect. So the idea of um, so the resonance rings of the bells ringing spreading out and the idea that British bell ringing is unique in being able to play music. You know, if you're on the continent, you put a rope and you get clang, clang, which is fine. But the, the control of the bells and creating this music together. So the other aspect was these banners, which I'll just talk about quickly, which was a step on the idea of sort of complementing the, the stained glass with other types of glass. So Linda and I work with um, maquettes is a bit of a posh word for the box that we built to put this design in, and then little you know little versions um, of the ringing method, ringing methods, and playing with you know them sort of degrading in and out. We don't want them to just sort of be posters. Um, but, and then playing on site with light tests. So that was a situation, you know, the question about did I put sandblasting, just taking things on, getting samples made on site. So this is mirror that's sandblasted and laminated to a backing sheet, drilled and uh, wall mounted. Um, it was very difficult to get them made because because I made the samples, I sort of knew what I wanted. I mean, maybe it was the wrong time, but we ended up going to Pearson's uh, up in Liverpool because I'd send the files to people. I mean, these are kind of all right, you know, it's like positive negative. <coughs> but these ones, I can imagine firm going, I don't want to do that, thanks. <laughs> um, so this is Lisa, who often helps me in the studio. Can you tell I'm a bit tired there? <laughs> And it propped up. Um, so they were great. They got the glass ready. We went up. Many cans of Diet Coke and music later. Picked it all. They sandblasted it. And then we picked it all off. Um, and got them made. But I love this. It's very simple, this graduation. Um, then my trusted team. Going to fit them so you get a sense of the size. Um, actually, I'll put this in. Just to finish. Um, I don't know if it sounds on actually. So it's not great in winning this, but it shows it really shows the, how the banners relate to them.
And what was lovely about getting that bit of film was that it was a real community project and that tower that you see at the end ended up being the walls were cleaned, they restored the ceiling, you know, the local men's sort of shed project got involved in remaking bosses for it. You know, it became this kind of sort of hub of community activity. And the whole point about the, the window was about this working together aspect and being able to do more together than apart. So um, that was opened in January 2020. And then cool, we have So um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you for your patience. Um, and if you've got any questions, please. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Um, we very rarely talk about cost. Um, can I so we're not going to now. Was the project established at the beginning of that project, or did it evolve as you? <laughs> oh, the word evolve. Do you know what? It wasn't established, and what what was a little bit scary about it, and I've never done it before, it was going to be a fundraising project. <laughs> So you sort of go, okay, give me, give me a call when you've got some dosh. But um, I have to say, uh, this project was quite unique in a couple of ways, in that they had a, there was a project manager, Richard Lloyd, hello, hello Richard, you're watching this, uh, and a team, and they were fantastic, because I was talking to Rachel earlier, they, they went out, they talked to people about glass, what glass, they talked to the DACs of local areas, and then they went out and did a little tour, and they went and looked at lots of glass, and they had a very clear sense of what they were trying to achieve. What they, and so the whole thing was, you know sometimes you go, oh, it's fundraising, you think, no, oh, it's never going to happen. But this wasn't that, and um, so the funds were raised for the design stage, and then I sort of worked out a cost and said, there we are. Um, and stage it, and we sort of worked it out so that it wasn't speculative, because normally that's it's a little bit tricky, isn't it, fundraising? So, uh, yeah, but it worked out. So, no, it wasn't established, and actually, it wasn't for this window either. I went, to the, they picked a window, and I, I very rarely say, I don't think that's the right window, because it's a little bit, you know, in your face. But the whole thing was about celebrating bell ringing, and there was this west window in the bell tower, which just sort of, and they wanted a contemporary piece. You know, they were very determined. They wanted a contemporary piece, and they were all on board with that. But it was a li little bit of, but we'll just pop it round there, so that if it's a little bit troublesome, it's not quite in the way. And I thought, oh, I don't know that those two things go together. Now, I either do it, or not like that, because I knew they wanted to do it. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't my ego going to do it. I knew they wanted that, so I suggested that window, which was going to be a much bigger budget anyway and they didn't they didn't flinch they went yes let's do it so um all uh all due to them really thank you okay right strong rachel strong strong, <laughs> strong. fabulous thank, thank you, you very much yeah. um